uh, welcome everyone. Um, this uh, optional informal uh, discussion for um, 8225 STS042. Uh, as hopefully you all know, we're just going to take our time, just very informally um, chat about really anything that's on your mind around the most recent material, but in particular things that might have been um, curious or puzzling or disturbing or whatever, any of the above, um, that might have been um, elicited in your mind upon watching the documentary film A Day After Trinity. Um, I actually just watched the YouTube version uh, with some of my family over the weekend. I didn't realize how poor the video quality was. I apologize for that. If you're watching on a small device, maybe you didn't notice, but if you were watching it a super big, crazy, large TV, you would have seen it was very blotchy visually. But anyway, hopefully it was nonetheless clear enough to, uh, to get the gist. Um, and I have no sort of agenda for today. I'm really just happy to go. Uh, however, whatever questions are on or comments or thoughts are on people's minds. So anyone uh, should feel free to jump in. I think I, I expect we'll have a small enough group. We, can, we don't have to worry about breakout rooms. We can just kind of manage the discussion, hopefully pretty uh, informally with, with the group this way. So I'm curious, I mean, just the floor is open. What, were, were there things that um, <clears throat> surprised you from the film, things that surprised you the film didn't, you know, broach or cover any, anything, the whole, the whole topic's open. Really interesting question. That's, that's a juicy one. Um, <clears throat> and I should also say, by the way, I, I, as you, even more than usual, I invite the TAs to, to, to jump in as well. Uh, please don't be shy. Um, but let me give you my, my first crack at that. Um, I think a lot of people who were convinced to work on the project, and the film gives a little hint of that, they really were not given very much in advance to go on, right? They had to make a fairly snap decision uh, in the middle of very you know, dislocated times. And often because of secrecy, they couldn't be given a kind of full briefing ahead of time. They, some of them didn't, didn't have much idea of what was, what was coming. And I, my sense of it is a lot of the folks who, who did volunteer then to, to join the project um, really were deeply concerned about uh, developments in Europe, especially around uh, what looked like the kind of unchecked uh, military progress of the Nazis. Um, so I think there was uh, a sense that they, that, that they wanted to find some way to contribute to, to the defense effort, to the war effort. Um, now that raises other questions, which, were, which are broached at least briefly in the film. If, if many people's principal motivation had to do with um, Nazi Germany, what happened between so-called VE Day, the, the, the ultimate defeat of the Nazis in April of 1945, uh, and the, and the uh, sort of remainder of the project, let alone the use of the weapons uh, in, against Japan. So we, can, we should come back to that. But nonetheless, I think people felt strongly they wanted to do something. Uh, many people did, even very young people. And this was a decision formed without full information, right? Because often they literally couldn't be brief. We, I, we talked last time about these, um, the so-called indoctrination course that Robert Serber gave once they actually arrived at Los Alamos. Uh, for some of them that was, he had to tell them, oh, we gathered here to build a bomb. Like he first had to say that because it was, would not, might not have been obvious to everyone yet uh, when they gathered. I just find that extraordinary. Um, there's a larger question though, a larger thing that, that a, actually a good friend of mine, historian Michael Gordon has written a really interesting short book about. Um, the book is called Five Days in August, which comes to another aspect of your question, which is how did many people, scientists on the project, uh, military officials, political leaders, uh, any uh, journalists, other policymakers, how did, Hulk, how did many different kinds of people come to think about the bomb once they learned about it? And Michael's argument in brief, let's see if I do justice to it. Again, the, some of the TAs know this book very, very well, so they should correct me. But my recollection of my friend's book um, is, is more or less the following, that the, the bomb was treated by many, many of these folks as not particularly unusual or special prior to its use. Uh, and and my, my favorite parts of Michael's book actually have to do with the mechanics of how the, how the weapons were literally put together and then kind of armed for use uh, in, in um, against targets in Japan. So on the island of Tinian, there's some, some footage in the, in the film of the kind of staging grounds on Tinian. And my understanding is it's not that President Truman, the US President Truman gave direct orders every time to say, drop a bomb now on Hiroshima, drop a bomb now on Nagasaki. There was no such order given, not that specific. The decision was made 
to use the weapons when they were available up to the discretion of the field commanders, just like every other kind of weapons, every other kind of bombing. Uh, again, as, as there was some uh, footage in the film and others might, you might already have known, there had been uh, campaigns of, of um, what was called incendiary bombing using certain kinds of conventional explosives that were especially likely to cause ground fires um, against uh, some cities in Europe, but, but many cities in Japan by the Allied Air Forces, US in particular. Uh, and those weren't sort of separately ordered from on high. They, they were field, there was a chain of command in the field, so to speak, and up to their expert judgment, uh, were the conditions right? Would, is there a storm coming? Should they launch you know, um, a series of bombing raids or not? That was not a presidential level decision or even necessarily a general's level decision that was kind of outsourced to the, to the rank, ranking officers in the field. And what astonishes me, what Michael found is that the, the, in the earliest stages, the nuclear weapons were treated like that. They were, they were plugged into an existing system of local decision-making about when to use them, uh, under what circumstances. Uh, and that, Michael suggests, shows that they were not treated as a sort of separate category early on. They were treated like another weapon. There have been many other kinds of weapons developed and deployed sort of from scratch in the course of the war. And that these were kind of treated at least logistically or, or um, kind of bureaucratically like, you know, like yet another weapon to be deployed uh, largely at the kind of discretion of the of the local um, kind of field commanders, um, and that the standing to the extent there was a standing order at all, it was use them when you got them. It wasn't like drop one, wait three days. There was no such there was no such coordination of that level, and in fact there was no third bomb ready. There, the two were dropped. The, bo the bomb dropped against Nagasaki was, and you get a little bit of this in the film, was uh, the schedule was pushed up by the local field commanders because there was a worried about uh, severe weather, a kind of typhoon coming, it would have threatened certain kinds of, um, uh, you know, aircraft runs. So, uh, so, and in fact, Nagasaki wasn't even the original target city. There was a decision made by the, by the pilot in mid flight to change path, I think largely because of things like changing conditions in the weather and so on. So these were not highly staged or high, or these are not highly, um, kind of carefully thought out and vetted individual decisions. The decision was load them into the planes and drop when you got them. And they had two, the, ma the makings for a third, not yet compiled weapon, were literally on a boat making their way to Tinian at the time that, uh, that Japan surrendered. So the idea was drop, as, drop them and, uh, one after the other, much like the incendiary bombing raids had been, you know, kind of uh, one after the other. Um, and what, what Michael and others have argued, what made it seem, what made the atomic weapons seem special was the fact that the fighting stopped, which was not necessarily predicted. Uh, no one thought you drop one and they'll stop, or at least no one seems to have thought that. No one thought if we time the other one very carefully, that'll convince them. There was no such calculation for the timing of, of the second bomb that was used in this case against Nagasaki. And they were prepared, they were preparing to drop a third one and they would have dropped a fourth if they had one. They just didn't, literally didn't have the parts. Um, so Michael argues that it was actually uh, in response to the fact that unlike other military campaigns, th there was at least a coincidence in time this time around that Japan uh, did surrender within days of the second bombing, that then in kind of a post hoc rationalization, according to Michael, kind of made people think the, that the atomic weapons were now somehow in the category of their own or different or special. It was a long answer. It's a very complicated question. Um, I think a bunch of the scientists who worked, for example, on Los Alamos, scientists, engineers, I think they thought this was different early on. And some of their concerns we hear about, less so in the film, but other you know, reminiscences and interviews and so on, memoirs have been published, is that they were often quite concerned that some of the uh, army figures, military figures, who also witnessed, for example, the Trinity test, were not as shocked as the scientists were. I think I mentioned very, very briefly in my previous lecture that for the Trinity test in um, Alamogordo, New Mexico, one of the things that really, really seems to have left a visceral reaction to many of the folks who, who then were able to inspect the, 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 the what would soon call, be called ground zero, was that the, the heat and especially pressure of the blast had fused desert sand into glass. And that, at least as some of these scientists re later recalled, that gave them a kind of visceral sense of the forces at play. And then they were, some of them report being equally viscerally upset that the generals weren't impressed by that. 
So, the, so some of the scientists seem to think we are playing with the forces that power the sun. We're, we're, we're dealing with extraordinarily powerful physical phenomena. And so at least in their later recollections, they seem to have treated this as different, not just another TNT bomb souped up. And therefore they were concerned that others didn't treat it with a similar kind of differentness. But I, I'm pretty convinced by Michael's argument more broadly. If you look at the kind of political, high level political apparatus and the military planning and war department apparatus, this was treated at least bureaucratically in terms of like standing orders as such, much more like the next thing in the arsenal to drop as opposed to some total separate category in itself. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that, but uh, that's my not very brief take on, on that very juicy question. It's a good question. Right, that's, it's, thank you, Stephen. That's also a really hard, it's a good, important question, a hard one. Um, so, and we, I talked a little bit about this in, in a previous class session, but it's, um, but it's worth revisiting. So the short answer is many of these folks were aware, as I say, the scientists and engineers, let's say, were definitely aware that there was gonna be associated radiation and fallout, and that would not be good for people. Right. They knew there was a, a, an inherent clear danger that was not like um, you know, TNT or other conventional explosives. That really did strike many of them as being importantly different. They did not have anything like the sophisticated, large scale, statistically powerful, you know, controlled medical experimentation type results or body of knowledge that would develop um, later. So they didn't have, I mean, it would be on, on, we shouldn't expect them to have had the same knowledge about the human biological implications of fallout as we as the community would later acquire largely from the use of these weapons and from other kinds of tests so they didn't know what what would later be known they knew something they knew enough to 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 treat it very um relatively carefully it is yeah thank you they're aware to it that that's at least a likely possibility on the other hand they were pretty cavalier even with their own personal safety so for example uh, one of my, I think I mentioned briefly, one of my college professors who had just retired before I started college, 10,000 years ago approximately, uh, he had served as a very young kid on the Manhattan Project. I mean, he like a kid. He was basically a very, like a first year grad student. So even RTAs are, are more advanced than this kid was uh, when he joined the project. Uh, and he would say, you know, they would carry little radioactive sources in their like in their like jacket or vest pockets to, to calibrate the local you know machinery. So they would put you know, alpha meters next to their gut. I don't recommend you do that today. Like that's so so there was a kind of cavalierness about radioactivity in general for a lot of these folks. Partly, oh, there's a war on, we don't have time to be all special and careful. Partly they didn't know what, what would later be better known. And then partly for people who were working on the project uh, who weren't themselves scientists or engineers, there was a, a really, I think, um, <clears throat> very significant lack of effort to better inform those people about appropriate safety procedures that based on the knowledge that even was in hand at the time. See what I mean? And that's even before we get to, and that's just for kind of radioactive emitters generally. Then we come to the question of, of fallout specifically from what, from the use of these weapons in a, in a large human population. And that again, they knew enough that it was gonna lead to, they knew enough to start studying long-term effects. They figured this would not be good for people. They didn't have detailed information about the, which cancers at what rates, what kinds of you know, demographics, young children affected differently than older people, the role of pre-existing conditions, the kinds of things that kind of biostatisticians would, would come to study much more carefully later. So again, that was a pretty long answer, but they, 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 they were not entirely ignorant of the dangers of radio radioactivity in general, or some of the, some of the likely um, <clears throat> uh, implications of, of radioactive fallout from the use of these things in a city. And they just, you know, they didn't know what, what other people would, would, would learn in more detail later. That's a great point. I'll just add again quickly, thank you, Tiffany, on that point too. Uh, coming back maybe to, to Stephen's question more directly uh, than I did, meaning more directly for me than I did for, there was a long-term study of people who were, who were um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the time these weapon, the bombs went off, long-term longitudinal study, uh, largely by, under US auspices. So Japan, as you may know, was occupied by the allied forces, mostly US, but the sort of allies of World War II for, for uh, the better part of a decade, starting uh, very soon after surrender. So there were a lot of US-based long-term studies of the effects of the weapons on site. Um, including a lot of these kind of biomedical, uh, kind of epidemiological type studies. And yet it still remains deeply, deeply 
um, controversial, how many deaths to attribute to the bombings, partly because of different definitions about who, who, who was sort of exposed in what way, partly to the usual difficulties statistically of saying, would, would this many people have gotten lung cancer even if they hadn't been exposed to this kind of, um, you know, basically pathogen for lack of a better word, radioactive source. And also because a lot of the stuff remains classified or remain classified for a long, long time anyway. So we have the, one of the themes we'll come to a bit in this class, we've already had a little hint of it, is the role of classification in, in making it difficult to draw certain kinds of conclusions from otherwise very complicated scientific and technical projects. Uh, in this case, it was, um, a lot of the stuff was, was subject to kind of born classified um, strictures which didn't help with kind of independent statisticians redoing the stats and the stuff that we would kind of take for granted in, in, in uh, kind of peer reviewed scientific studies today. So, so literally today, I'm sure, I didn't look recently, but I'm sure if anyone Googles goes on Wikipedia, it says how many casualties from the bombing of Hiroshima, there'll probably be one of these like warning comment signs, like people are flaming each other, the editors don't agree because to this day, 75 years later, asking what sounds like, what, what sounds like a countable, straight, seemingly straightforward question, how many people were affected, killed, injured, whatever, is remarkably unstraightforward to, to very well-intentioned experts, let alone people who, who are operating from more, um, uh, from further away from the, from the original information. So it gets really tricky to assess literally how many people's lives, how many people were killed. The immediate blast damage that actually was uh, counted up pretty, pretty compellingly clearly. There's not much argument about who, who died within the first week, but all these kind of long tail uh, more kind of epidemiological type things remain actually quite tricky and, and can inspire some real, um, you know, real earnest debate. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, Lulu. And it's, again, it's tricky. I find it tricky myself. Um, and, and just biologically, I'm closer to those times than most of the rest of you, but not that much closer. Um, I mean, I grew up during the Cold War and thinking about, I didn't have to do duck and cover drills during like H-bomb raids, but you know, like my parents did, so I heard about it. Anyway, but nonetheless, it's hard, it's, it's hard to get my mind back to a time of, of kind of total war. Thank, I mean, thank goodness, right? But if you look at the casualty counts, the fatality counts from the incendiary bombings of Tokyo and Dresden, they very likely exceeded at least the short-term casualty counts from the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At least they were comparable. Meaning there, there were cities where hundreds of thousands of people were killed by dropping of weapons from aircraft multiple times in just the weeks, let alone months before these, 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 to our eyes, new kinds of weapons were used in August of 45. So the scale of, of the human cost of civilian, of, of total war, where it's not people in uniform fighting on a battlefield, but anyone who's within some geographical territory is suddenly considering kind of fair game as a target. That wasn't invented you know, with, with the use of nuclear weapons. And, and, the, and the difference that sometimes people would, would articulate soon afterwards was it took a thousand aircraft to level Tokyo and it took one to level Hiroshima. So there was some people would start to say, these really are different, let's be careful, let's think about this carefully. Others would say, you know, 100,000 people dead that's like last Thursday, you know, it's just a remarkable how, what, what's the comparison class? Let me put it that way. What are you comparing it with? And how do our own individual sensibilities shift uh, compared to um, what many of these folks were, were, were kind of immersed in at the time? And I don't say that to, to, to say they, they, there's no culpability. I'm just saying it's astonishing to me that that might've seemed sort of unremarkable in its day, given, given three and a half, four years of, of this really devastating civilian, heavy civilian law, so-called total war. Um, so, so I just find that, uh, I mean, thankfully, I don't, think, I don't think we have that kind of experience in, in any of our lifetimes of that kind of um, civilian loss of life in, in, in wartime. Not that there's been plenty of bad things happen since, but um, so, yeah, anyway, so, so that just, just sort of the, the scale of, hu of, of civilian human loss uh, where you were, you, were, you were deemed a legitimate target if you happened to live in a city, let alone if you were you know, drafted, let alone if you volunteered or, or, or whatever. Yeah, and again, I, not, not, not to get ahead of ourselves, but for this coming Wednesday's class session, we'll talk about, and you get a hint of this in the film as well, the, you know, the, the next step that happened to have been taken in this thread of discussion was the development of, of uh, hydrogen weapons, 
which you know are roughly speaking a thousand plus times more destructive by any parameter you choose to measure than 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 the weapons that had already been used. Right, right. You know, I, on the question of Niels Bohr, it's a great point, Lucas, and I think it's a it, it's a lot like something we talked at least briefly about in, in a class session, uh, maybe two classes ago, on, on Einstein's you know very famous letter to to President Franklin Roosevelt as well. These are these for a long time were held up by scientists as examples of you know these Nobel Prize winning architects of modern physics were also geniuses of the human condition and political wizards. I wish any of that were true, <laughs> and it's not to take away from either Einstein or Bohr to say that those stories are are kind of not wishful thinking. Bohr very earnestly tried to serve in exactly the capacity you, you, you mentioned, because you're quite right. And the fact is he was completely and kind of predictably ineffective at it. No one had any reason to listen to this mumbling Copenhagen guy who you know, didn't seem to know anything about, about uh, how governments work. So he, his, his entreaties, his efforts, were he did make the efforts. Let's give him credit for that. He was indeed, he did see ahead and he, he, was, he was predictive as many people were of a kind of um, arms race unless there was this narrow window of opportunity to try to avert an arms race, uh, mutual suspicions uh, and distrust growing. But he, I, I, think, I think there was sort of very little chance of him having any actual success. And it turns out he had approximately zero success. So it's not to fault him for trying or for recognizing this is um, a likely scenario. But we, we tend to hear about these stories by like biographers of Niels Bohr, who, who are enamored of the many extraordinary things that Bohr was able to do during his lifetime. But if we, if we, if we ask the same question of you know, historians of US foreign relations, they'll say Niels who? Because it had ex literally zero impact, you know, from, at least from where they're sitting, on, on the very, very complicated relations between uh, US and Britain, let alone US and the Soviets or anything else. So, so I guess I take these, these these, these episodes as examples that some of these physicists were indeed trying to think one or two steps ahead and they were not, maybe they misjudged, you know, their own kind of likely uh, influence. Um, so they get credit in my mind for thinking about it at all and trying, but, but the, the, it's not much of a track record, you know, in, in hindsight. a great question yeah but thank you really interesting so um the first impact was um it was it was not very many from any given campus so it wasn't like one department was emptied out and in fact there was a at the time a very very strong concern on many 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 university and college campuses in the u.s to keep as many physicists on site as possible because they were involved in teaching what we would now consider basically classical physics um block sliding down planes and, and elementary um, circuits and radio, which was often done in physics departments, not a separate electronic engineering department in many, many places in time. So there was this huge concern about, literally they talked about rationing um, and stockpiling physics instructors to teach sort of canonical college students, but also to teach huge numbers of um, Navy and Army special students who were drafted sometimes often straight out of high school, uh, were not yet college students, and were sent to many, many campuses around the US um, to, for like crash course study, uh, very accelerated schedules um, to learn basically rudimentary physics, like, like for radio communication or, you know, or like sighting or sound ranging. It really was like classical physics. And in fact, physics departments were admonished not to waste their time teaching quantum mechanics or nuclear physics because that's not gonna be of any importance during the war. That kind of makes me smirk. Uh, and they should put all their efforts teaching like classical E&M uh, and, and Newtonian mechanics, um, whether it's for, you know, how do you measure air pressure? How, what's a barometer? What, you know, how do you measure angles with a, with a handheld, um, you know, kind of sighting device? So I find that really fascinating. So the, the term that's often used, you might have heard, the Second World War has often been called the, the physicist's war. And that term has usually been taken to mean, oh, we know what that means. It was all about radar and the sort of exotic uh, weapons projects like uh, the, the Manhattan Project. And so I actually wrote about this recently. It turns out the phrase was introduced um, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, before there was Los Alamos Laboratory, at a time when radar was still deeply classified. The usage of the term, if you do one of these Google engrams, all these fun things we could do now searching in the English language corpus, the phrase physicist wars, use of it spiked in 1943, 
at which time anything about that had project was deeply, deeply classified. They were not printing editorials about the nuclear weapons in the, you know, in the op-ed pages. So the term physics war was, was used to respond to the fact that, it, that, uh, that more and more young people, mostly men, mostly boys, uh, had to be trained in crash course settings on what we would call classical physics for practical purposes in the battlefield, which by which they meant, you know, barometric pressure, measure angles, use sighting on a gun and uh, elementary electronics and circuits. So the physicists were, the meaning of the term actually changed quite dramatically after this, after this dramatic revelation about these new se previously secret, secret weapons projects and, and the kind of impacts they had. So there, there were, I mean, so the, so the physics classrooms were bulging faster than ever before. They weren't getting drained out. There were more people rushing to study physics, more, more people who were put into physics classes, whether they chose to or not, and more and more people teaching physics, in, not just from math and chemistry, but from music, anyone who had any kind of quantitative skills, political science, if you know any statistics, good. Now, you know, here's a crash course to relearn, you know, um, calculus, and you're going to teach Maxwell's equations next week. And again, anyone who was caught poaching, that was their word, stealing legitimate physics instructors from one campus uh, were subject to like public shaming. So there was an effort to get to keep more and more physics instructors in the classrooms, not to teach fancy, fancy nuclear fission, but rather these other topics. Um, and that meant that when a couple slipped away, it was, I think, lost kind of in the noise, I have a feeling, because uh, there was so much tumult about this huge kind of throughput. MIT's campus uh, switched to basically 12 month instruction. And we had, I think at the height of this, three times more, or not three times, it was like a three to two ratio, so I guess, one and a half times more so-called special students, meaning full-time army and Navy students assigned to MIT for like six week terms than MIT students. So the MIT's own campus was, was kind of taken over, was put into high gear. And that was, that was uh, very common in many, many other um, liberal arts, tiny liberal arts colleges, big universities, everything in between. Um, these very, very intensive kind of short-term uh, crash course uh, things. In fact, as I, if I can find it in time, I'll put it in the, in the chat, one of my favorite photos is actually of 10250. Our, I don't know if it's your beloved or your hated, your a room many of you will probably know. One of our big, big lecture halls, 10250, filled with young men in uniform, taking one of these crash course classes in probably like elementary circuits, uh, and it just it just a sea of faces that all look the same and all the same uniforms. Just you know, 400 people filling 10250, all in in their khakis. That's, that's what campus at MIT was, was, was like. That was a predominant thing as opposed to, uh, hey, where'd all these people go? They must be doing something top secret. Um, Gary, you're up, and then Alex. Um, I just wanted to share a, a, a movie suggestion because you mentioned Dresden, and it, it's a chilling movie, but it's about how things can get normalized. Bob McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense mm -hmm. during the Vietnam War, but was very involved in World War II uh, with regard to the bombings in Tokyo, the T Tokyo fire bombing. I got to know Bob very late in his life and I thought, I'm gonna hate this guy. Yeah. I, I, I grew up just hating the whole idea of who the Secretary of Defense in the Vietnam War might be. And he, he was uh, reflective about it. And he made this movie when I knew him, but he, he, it's really worthwhile to watch The Fog of War. The war yes, uh, one other story about normalizing, my father, was a corporal, never went to college, and he was in Tidian. Yeah. And so the day after Nagasaki, the general said to him, Sammy, you want to go up and see what we did yesterday? So my dad flew over Nagasaki literally the day after. 30 or 40 years later, if I had asked my dad about it, and he was a good man, <laughs> I, love, I love him to this day, um, but he would say, I'd say, what do you think? He said, Gary, we did what we needed to do. He was just a corporal, he was a radio mechanic. Yeah, uh, but it got, it got normalized. I have a question for you, David. Do you know why um, Jacob Beezer was the only man on both? I don't know the answer, but I knew his son. I knew Jerry Beezer, his son, but Jacob Beezer was the radar man on both flights. And oh, why did they do that? He's the only person that was on both flights. And that's fascinating. I didn't I didn't know that, Gary. So my guess, I'm just guessing, I'm speculating, and Wikipedia might answer it you know, quicker and maybe even more accurately than me. My guess is that it was still you know, it was kind of a shoestring operation. Like Tinian, I mean, they, they were throwing this thing together. They just barely gotten the kind of airstrip to dry. You know, that, that, it was so last minute that my guess is it was just, it could, it could as well have been short staffed as, as any kind of strategic reason, especially if it, was, if it was a more kind of specialized role like the radar operator. 
uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he was the person who had been trained and was available. I don't know if it was any more than that. But other, others might know, or it could well be a more compelling. I mean, it was terrible. As kids, we used to kid his kid in, in horrible ways. So it's right. his kids got scored from his father's doing it. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Gary, let's see, something else you had said. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let me just say briefly, because something the film didn't really uh, get into. A lot of the scholarship in the 40 years since even the film came out, let alone the 75 years since the events in question, has really gone around and around, frankly, or, or, or has been a, a very vigorous debate, I'll put it that way, about um, basically uh, were the bombs needed? That's kind of a second guessing after the fact. Or put it a little more pro prospectively, what convinced people to give this standing order to use, to use these weapons you know, at all? And the, soon after the war, I think it was 1947, the, the, then, the person who had been Secretary of War during the Second World War, uh, Henry Stimson, published a famous, famous article basically justifying the use of the nuclear weapons. And he's saying it saved a million lives. I, and then became, was it either a million fatalities or casualties? Either way, he said, if the United States had to actually launch this planned in-person invasion of the mainland of Japan, if there, were, if there was no way to get to, to secure a surrender and an end of the war, other than a fully armed invasion of the mainland, which is what was indeed being planned by US, most of the US allied forces. Then the casualty count, both among US soldiers and among Japanese civilians would have been astronomical. And, they, they, and he mentions the figure 1 million. Well, other, where did he get the figure 1 million from? It seems to have been invented in 1947. It seems not to have come from any classified or since declassified military planning document ahead of time. So, so then the question has becomes, would an invasion have been necessary? Were there other reasons to have thought at the space of information available at the time that Japan might or might not have been getting closer to a surrender even prior to the use of the bombs alone would an invasion have been needed? And if an invasion were needed, where did these casualty figures, these projected figures have come from? So I'll just say, I don't have, I don't know all the answers, but I know people have poured over this very, very carefully and say each of those questions is subject to, let's say, many compelling and quite different answers. Um, so, so many, many US uh, military officials, as later came out in, in, in declassified documents that were at the time quite secret, were, were already raising skepticism about whether a, a, a full U of invasion would be needed at all. And then other people say, oh, but that was before the really uh, quite horrible fighting in Okinawa, which was in June. So maybe there was a kind of re re a fear, a concern that the Japanese troops would actually not surrender, even if they were clearly uh, you know, um, overwhelmed numerically. So like, did the, which military officials even thought we'd need, the, we, the United States would need to mount an invasion? That's already actually pretty complicated based on the documents that have since much later become available. Some people clearly wrote down, Japan is on the brink of surrender anyway, not you know, prior to the use of the weapons, prior to any invasion. Other people said, oh, we thought they might surrender, but now we're not so sure because of the really quite you know, just horrific fighting, the kind of dug in fighting, especially at Okinawa, late, late, not too long before the use of the nuclear weapons. Then there are all these questions like, were the, were the weapons used to end the war or to secure the post-war? So was it signaling vis-a-vis rivalries with uh, the Soviet Union, which is a, a popular thesis or other things. Was it, were they used for a kind of geopolitical strategy at least as much, if not more, than for direct kind of military strategy? And again, there are very compelling arguments based on lots and lots of documents on kind of, not just both sides, but the whole kind of spectrum of that. It gets, it gets pretty murky pretty quickly. So, uh, so there are waves of kind of re revisiting these questions of, uh, of what, what, what military role do the weapons play? And I'm not saying one or the other. I actually, I think it's complicated, right? But you can get these really interesting studies based on a lot more than, than what was publicly accessible uh, in 1955 or even 1965 with, the, with much more passage of time and much more active use of Freedom of Information Act and declassification and so on. You know, it's, it, it's pretty complicated. Um, and so again, that we go back to an early question, were the bombs, did the bombs end the war? Were they somehow special that incendiary bombings that leveled cities were not capable of ending the war, but these special weapons were? That was a popular interpretation very soon after the war when these things were revealed in such a dramatic way. And then generations since have gone back to the question. And I think it's, it's, a little, it's more complicated, more subtle than some of the early pronouncements, either pro or con. 
Uh, and if people are interested, I could, I'd be glad to share kind of reading lists of lots of things that have dug into that uh, since then. I think the answer is neither. And here, here's my understanding, Alex, but again, I'm, this is my, uh, I think it was raised as a serious question long before the test and settled to everyone's satisfaction before the test. So I don't think it was only ever, I don't think it was only a joke. I think by the time of the test date, people weren't worried about that the way they once had legitimately sat down and calculated. They didn't just say, gosh, I wonder, let's try it. So I don't think it was a joke, but I also think it was no longer a kind of live de debated scientific question by, by mid July of 45. Um, I think there, you know, my understanding is Enrico Fermi did, was the one who, rate, who articulated that question, but not like the morning of. I think there was enough time for enough people to, to sit at that and check each other's calculations and really, and not only physicists, actually people know stuff like chemists and other people who had relevant expertise. Um, I think there was, there was a vetting of that question well before the test date. Yes, it's, so the short answer is yes, but again, I don't, but, but, but you, you, you phrased it very, very well. Actually, was there any indication? The answer was yes, not definitive indication. That's why it's still, you know, you know the phrase war is hell. Like it's, it's, it's hell for information as well as for all the more, more obvious um, reasons. So here's what, here's what I mean by that. It has come to light since then that first of all, uh, some countries had cracked the Japanese uh, encrypted cables. So, and, and, had, and was leaking that information to Washington and, and London and, and probably Moscow as well. So some elements of the Japanese government, which at this point was highly fractured and not really functioning very easily because Tokyo had been leveled. Some parts of the Japanese government were sending out feelers to try to see if a, if a neutral third party would, could begin um, peace negotiations or you know, negotiations to end the fighting. It's not clear that they had the authority to speak for the emperor who was refusing to step down and that was part of this unconditional surrender um, and so on. So it's not clear if that represented sort of the, what fraction of the ex then existing Japanese government that represented. It's also not clear how far that ever got. But there, was some, there indeed was some evidence that some highly placed members of the Japanese government before the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were seeking to start basically um, negotiations. They were seeking a third party who might broker them. And again, that doesn't mean they were on the verge of surrender. What seems to be more clear than anything else from these other scholars, not my own work, but I've learned from other people who've looked at this much more carefully, is that it was just complete disarray. Um, I mean, Washington DC was not subject to that kind of bombardment. And so there was something like a functioning chain of command and something like you know a fractious but still functioning, you know, kind of series of decision makers who could disagree, but nonetheless act on behalf of a, of a functioning government. I think not much of that was functioning the same way in Japan by that point in the war, because of things like the enormous disruptions from the, from the incendiary bombing. There were different factions as, they were off, as one might expect. There were different factions in the US and in Britain. There were different factions within Japan. And it wasn't just kind of military civilian. There were different kind of complicated, um, different kind of loyalties and, and, and groups. And so it was, it's not clear who was speaking for whom and if they even were capable of having the equivalent of, of like a kind of full cabinet meeting the way we might expect in a US context. So that's again, a, so it's a great question, Alex, because, and unfortunately the answer again is like, oh gosh, it's complicated. So with the fullness of time, evidence has, has come out that there were some parties looking to do some things. What's not at all clear, and maybe wasn't clear even at the time, was in a sense who, would that have carried the day? Who, for, who were they speaking on behalf of? Who had the authority at the time? Because I think that had gotten very, very, um, again, let's just say non-trivial. So it's a great, it's a great, great question. Yeah. Sure, yeah, no, the great question. A lot, 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 lot has been written about the Oppenheimer um, affair, let's say the Oppenheimer hearing. Um, over the years, again, people keep revisiting it as more and more it becomes declassified, more people are interviewed, and you know, there's a lot. Oppen this 100th anniversary of Oppenheimer's birth was 2004. And over the 12 months of his centennial birth year, there were 12, like, like one per month, 12 full length biographies published just in that year, at least 12 that I counted, there could have been more. So, I mean, when I say there's like an Oppenheimer industry pouring over this, that's, that's what I mean, huge, huge um, amount of, of study of this. So let me just say briefly therefore, instead of going on for hours. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit about this also in Wednesday's class. Oppenheimer uh, you know, ended the war um, really as seen as, as, as the person who built the bomb. 
which is, um, you know, not historically accurate. The, the, the Manhattan Project had 125,000 people, and even the so-called inner circle was, you know, many, many people, not just one or two. But he really became the kind of face of it, and that became both for good and for ill. I mean, he was seen, he was treated as a hero for, for many people who thought that the bomb had entered the war and therefore saved lives, which was a dominant interpretation uh, soon after the war in the United States. He was seen as this kind of wizardly, you know, philosopher king, like the film says, who, who had made it happen uh, despite all the odds. On the other hand, that also made some people think that he was uniquely dangerous. If there is a kind of single mastermind or a single set of secrets with which these things can be made, uh, then, then that invites the, uh, extra scrutiny, right? And this is, something, this is something we'll talk a bit more in Wednesday's class. So there was um, a lot of scrutiny as the political assumptions and fortunes and, and kind of groups in or out of, of power within the US and elsewhere shifted after the war. Oppenheimer, you know, kind of had made a lot of uh, um, enemies along the way because he was very smart and never, ever, ever shy about letting everyone know just how smart he was. He could be terrifically cutting. I mean, just mercilessly mocking of people whom he considered intellectually inferior. Sometimes of students, often of people who were outside of his immediate circle. So he was mean to physics students. He was horrible to people like the secretary of the Air Force, which is not a smart thing, by the way. If you're ever in the position to mock the secretary of the Air Force, let me advise you not to do it, whether, whether, whether the person deserves it or not. So then Oppenheimer kept making enemies, basically. He was in the spotlight, and that gave him the opportunity to shoot his mouth off a lot. And much like Galileo, you know, a couple centuries earlier, he was often adopting positions that one might find perfectly reasonable defensible, but defending them in an often very aggressive and kind of mocking sort of way. Galileo and the Pope, Oppenheimer and the Secretary of the Air Force, right, not actually so dissimilar in some ways. So Oppenheimer start, get, started collecting a slew of really quite in, emboldened uh, political uh, you know, enemies. And he started giving advice on strategic steps for the nuclear arsenal that many of them didn't like either. And again, we'll talk a bit about this and there was a hint of that in the film as well. So, so in less than a decade, he had then made a long series of quite powerful people who were pretty, pretty ticked off at him. Uh, and so in some sense, his hearing was, I don't know if it was overdetermined, but it wasn't actually such a shock the fact of the hearing, the fact that people wanted to get him. What was left out of the film, and this was largely came to light in, in more recent scholarship since the early 2000s, uh, is that Oppenheimer, you know, frankly was trying to kind of hold on for a long time. Uh, he, he, as we now know from, declass from since declassified documents, he often kind of sold a bunch of his own students out. Um, he was very desperate to protect, protect his younger brother, Frank, who does feature a lot in the film. Frank had been an explicit card carrying member of the Communist Party in the 30s, not active, but he joined the party as many, 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 many academics did in the US in the 30s. That wasn't so unusual, <coughs> but that made Frank an easy target. And so it looks like not infrequently, Robert Oppenheimer would kind of try to cut these deals. He thought he could control the situation, like don't bother my brother, he's actually no harm. But you, want it, but you know what, those guys, they're Reds as well. And often those guys he'd point to were some of his own former PhD students behind their backs. So he was doing a lot of these things, uh, as we now know, um, that, that, that paint a more complicated, frankly, human picture than the kind of saintly martyr that, that often comes up, even I think in this film, actually. So his, his own political skills were not quite as sterling as he often thought. His way of coping with fast changing political winds were not what I think any of us would, would hope we would do if in that situation. I don't know how, how we would do, but it didn't, it, didn't, oh, it didn't always look great as we now know. And it, almost, it comes off as almost a kind of grasping, at least in some of these scenarios. So Oppenheimer becomes frankly more interesting and also just much more human. There was a reason to write at least six of those 12 biographies in 2004. I mean, some, there's a lot of dimensions to this person and, and a stand-in for, for larger fast moving currents uh, within, certainly within the US and I think beyond that as well. So, um, so, so I, I'd be glad to talk more about Oppenheimer, but let me shift to Teller. Teller was also a very early uh, recruit, very active at wartime Los Alamos, and um, uh, already a very accomplished theoretical physicist. They all kind of knew, each, uh, that generation, they all knew each other. It was a small community before them. He's a, he was an emigre. He was a, a, a Hungarian uh, Jewish person who fled, you know, um, fascism. He'd been studying in Germany, like many of them. So he, he had very good reason to come to the United States in the 30s uh, and, and was hired here in that wave that we talked briefly about 
And he was very accomplished, in, in particular, very accomplished in nuclear physics, um, kind of ahead of the curve on that. He also, I think, because of his experiences with these very short-lived communist and socialist governments in Central Europe after the end of the First World War, a, a, a bunch of these emigres like Teller had experienced what they considered just really scary kind of just chaos in their reckoning right after the end of the First World War when they were basically late teens or, or, or early 20s. A lot of them from self-proclaimed communists or other socialists, short-lived, there was huge back and forth, the far left, the far right, the far left, the far right, militias in the streets, hopefully, hopefully nothing that any of us will experience uh, soon or not so soon. So Teller was a devoted anti-communist before he landed on US shore. From, I think really not because he read, you know, like um, Marx and was horrified because he'd seen these blood in the streets kind of fights in the 19, 19 teens. So he was very, uh, and many of the folks who came with him from that era shared those sentiments. So he was very kind of, um, we might say jingoistic. His adopted home really should develop the most significant weapons. We really should keep all these other kind of bad people at bay was a, a rough paraphrase. Now he spent the war, war years at Los Alamos trying to argue that the fission bomb was small potatoes. And why are we wasting our time with this? We should actually be going for a fusion bomb of the sort we will talk briefly about on Wednesday. So he kept butting heads with leadership because he thought they had the wrong priorities. This was at a time when there were still like micrograms of plutonium on the planet. No working device had been developed, alone tested. And he's like, why? that's such a trivial task. Give me all the resources. I want to build you know, a hydrogen bomb. He didn't quite say it that way, but he was very big, strong fights about resources and priorities. And so more or less kind of to appease him because he was a smart contributing member, he was given a small little study group even during the war uh, to work on fusion weapons. And I think even by his own reckoning, they got kind of nowhere, but it was, it was you know, a study group to lay the seas. In fact, even before there was a Los Alamos laboratory, he was arguing from literally the very first discussion on Berkeley's campus with Oppenheimer and the rest, that fission bombs would be trivial, we should be going right now from summer 1942 into fusion. I mean, that was his kind of idée fixe. And after the war, he becomes more and more, uh, he, he's more and more listened to by the folks who are getting more and more impatient with Oppenheimer. He he's seems like he has uh, answers that many of the, um, you know, kind of Air Force leadership after the war actually does want to hear. They want to hear about bigger bombs that would be under the control of the Air Force, that would be the reason the Air Force would be the most important you know, service branch. And all, all these things get tied up in kind of rivalries within the US uh, infrastructure. So Teller's star sort of rises, basically, or at least he has more people listening to him after the war, including uh, he's very influential, not him alone, but he was a big mover in getting a whole second weapons laboratory established, the Livermore National Laboratory which has opened its doors in September of 1952 with the express purpose of working full tilt on, on fusion weapons, um, this kind of thing. So he, he's moving in that. He, do, he did testify, as you heard in the film, uh, at Oppenheimer's security hearing in a way that really, when the transcript was published, uh, was seen as really devastating by many, many members of the physics community. He doesn't come out and explicitly call Oppenheimer a communist or um, you know, uh, a, a directly security risk, which other people were calling it fairly or unfairly. But he says Oppenheimer is a complicated person, which was not meant to be a compliment. And the, and the famous line, which I'll get pretty close, Teller says under oath, I wish that, the, that, these, that these big important tasks were in hands I understood better, so therefore could trust more. He says, I basically don't trust Oppenheimer because he is this kind of complicated, maybe scheming kind of person. And so Teller gives us basically damning, what's seen as damning testimony for, for decades. You know, he, he outlived Oppenheimer for decades. For decades, uh, people wouldn't shake his hand when he'd come to give a physics colloquium. It really was, it had an, a, a, a generation long impact on how people thought of him. Nonetheless, in other circles, many others couldn't get enough. And so he, he continued to have influence among certain US administrations well past the 80s. I mean, uh, really decades after uh, the 40s and 50s. So, you know, he, he I, it's easy. I mean, I, it, much like it's easy to venerate people like Niels Bohr, oh, world government, if only he could have carried the day. He's like, well, I don't think it works that way. Teller is, I think, often vilified, often by the same people who want to see heroes like Einstein, Bohr, and, and Oppenheimer. All these people are complicated and the world is complicated. And I, I don't want to leave the impression that Teller was somehow like a, a, a masterful demon, right? Which he's often been cast as. He's certainly 
had very, very different ideas about the scientist's responsibility and about the geopolitical stature of the US vis-a-vis -vis changes in Europe especially. And he was just dogged. I mean, he was just undeterrable uh, with this kind of uh, focus on more and more bigger fancy weapons and let's make them uh, available you know, more and more quickly. So that, that became the kind of symbol of this larger split within the community. Uh, be between the kind of Oppenheimer camp and the Teller camp. Ironically, Teller was being surveilled by the FBI just as much as Oppenheimer was. They didn't trust this strange, weirdo European Jew. Who is this guy? He came from places where they're communists. I mean, the FBI was really in overdrive in this period. I say chuckling now, it wasn't so funny. And there are these amazing passages in his once classified, in Teller's once classified file, saying, we don't trust this guy. We don't know who he's talking to. He's no more trustworthy than Oppenheimer. So. You know, it's a kind of, I don't want to say it's a shell game, but it wasn't like he was seen as unproblematic. He was seen as someone who said the things that some other powerful, powerful people wanted to hear more at that time. I think, I think he was useful. As well. I think he earnestly believed that, but he was also useful to, frankly, other people who, who really did understand a bit more of the kind of hard power, you know, um, power plays of, of, of Cold War politics. So I think Teller's also has much, much less attention paid to him in the, in the secondary literature, uh, even though he lived a much longer life and was involved in many more kind of unusual events. Um, but I, I honestly think it's a lingering sense that he was somehow just the bad guy. He's been cast, I think, in a kind of one dimensional role that I, that I think you know, there's just been less attention paid to the nuance that we might now get to try to do for someone like Oppenheimer. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get we'll get a little hint of that. It won't be the Chicago site, uh, but a little bit of that theme certainly comes up in the next film we'll watch, basically a, a week from now. And I'm going to figure out a way to make sure you can all see it through um, the Canvas site. The film's called Containment. I think I mentioned it briefly um, by uh, by my friend and colleague, and actually my former advisor, Peter Gallison, and some of his colleagues. Uh, so it's much more recent view of some of the kind of nuclear legacies, um, in particular environmental and, and um, radiological, um, and not just of the wartime, but of the of the kind of Cold War uh, period ever since, in, in some sense, still going on. So that uh, you know, how does one handle uh, waste byproducts of, of civilian nuclear power, let alone nuclear above ground nuclear testing, when some of these very very deeply dangerous poisonous isotopes have half-lives in the tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. So the stuff isn't going away anytime soon, uh, to put it mildly. And so that's the kind of thing that, 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 the, that the new film, the more recent film uh, kind of grapples with. And we'll, we'll, we'll watch that and, and we can have a similar session to talk about it uh, next week. I'll, I'll make sure we all have the details in, in email. But yeah, I mean, it, again, it's, it's one of these things where people knew better at the time they didn't know as much as we know now, but the, the kind of cavalierness or, or even sometimes callousness, I think, with which some legitimately dangerous materials were handled in the 40s and 50s, uh, it's still um, astonishing. And, and it's not good to say the only place it was worse was, was some parts of the Soviet Union. I mean, that, if that's a competition, that's not great in terms of just the cavalier uh, disregard for local populations. Um, that's sort of the only place more poisonous from nuclear efforts than Hanford is the corresponding site in, uh, I forgot which one it is, Tiffany might remember, but one of these sites within uh, the former Soviet Union, where they had also been doing enormously large scale plutonium production and similar things, things like that. Right, in fact, my understanding is that he, he was exposed because he threw himself on top of it to knock him apart. He basically threw, like, you, like a soldier would on a grenade or something like that to save you know, comrades, that he, he literally threw his body on these now, you know, now joined, uh, um, critical mass. So he was, so the, my mentor that I mentioned, uh, who had served as a young kid in Manhattan Project, so the rest of his life, my teacher wore Sloton's belt buckle. They'd been buddies. They were like total young kids together in, in, uh, at, at Los Alamos. And Sloton, so the accident happened soon after the end of the war, like weeks. They were still working full tilt. Uh, and, and Leonard Reeser was still there, my teacher. And so uh, Sloton died within days of the exposure. It was a very, very intense exposure right in his, in his gut, which is not a good place to absorb lots of these things. Uh, and so Leonard kept his, uh, got his belt buckle for the rest of his life. That, that, I only know the name because I heard about it when I was starting when I was about 18. But, but, but you're right, Alex, it's, it's an amazing story about, talking about Cavalier, anything that, like a kind of just shop level safety standards, let alone 
you know, treat these stuff, treat these things with some level of kind of um, awe and respect because of the forces of nature, which is like, don't prop stuff over with a screwdriver. Like, come on, you know, just basic level machine shop, let alone uh, safe handling of, of, of nuclear materials. So that's a great, that's another great example. Good. Any other questions? These are great topics, great questions. No, it was, it was definitely after. It's a good question, Luke. So I don't know the fine details. Some of the TAs might, might remember better from recent readings. The, the rough story goes like this, though. There was um, the, soon after the end of the war, and I guess I'll talk about this briefly on Wednesday, um, by, I was signed into law, I think, August of 46. So roughly a year after, after Japanese surrender, the US passed the Atomic Energy Act. Uh, and that was a sprawling piece of legislation that established the successor agency to the wartime Manhattan Project, nominally civilian. It, 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 it created what was called the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC. Um, uh, thank you, Tiffany. And, um, and, uh, but it also made uh, all things related to nuclear power born secret and, and subject only basically to military or, or official government control in the US. So it had a an, an kind of unintended consequence of hugely stifling a kind of private sector development of energy of, of, of energy generation of reactors. That was then uh, amended, a big amendment to the Atomic Energy Act in I think 53. Again, others on the call might remember, I think it's 1953, which, which began to make certain kinds of, we might call it private, private public partnerships, a kind of limited entrepreneurship possible in the power generation market. It still wasn't a free market, but it was no longer a felony to, to share certain kinds of, you know, documents of, of otherwise innocuous information, seemingly innocuous, not, with no, no kind of direct weapons potential. So it starts, you start getting a more active um, kind of, uh, uh, what's the word, active, um, sorry, uh, you know, trying to build up a, a kind of uh, working quasi-market private-public partnership with major industrial contractors like General Electric, like Westinghouse, uh, building um, uh, commercial react power reactors by the mid to late 50s. It, it doesn't take off the way other new technologies, you know, have done in history, because it still has, it has a lot of, um, the, a lingering period of not clear quite how to get this right. Uh, so, so by, over the course of the 50s, there were power reactors actually coming online. Uh, Shipping Port News, I think, was the first or among those famous somewhere in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, so they didn't become ubiquitous right away, but they were coming into um, genuine civilian use, you know, in the outskirts of populated areas uh, by the end of the 1950s. For the submarines and things, that was, again, I think, a, a mid to late 50s development. Uh, Admiral Rickover, um, Hyman Rickover was, I think, the main moving force behind trying to, um, what was often called, modernize the, the naval fleet, including making uh, reactor-driven submarines that could stay underwater much longer, for example, let alone armed with nuclear weapons, but just could, could, the, could, the, could the power come largely from nuclear reactors on board uh, for kind of strategic reasons, wouldn't have to surface as frequently or things like that. So again, I think those were being developed largely uh, in, uh, within the military, so we didn't have the same kind of public-private, same level. Uh, of, of um, friction, but those were being, again, I don't know when the first one came into service, probably by the early 60s or the latest, certainly under active development and testing by the 50s, the late 50s. Um, and as we'll see in, in Wednesday's class, this also begins to coincide with growing concerns about, um, about fallout, so about above ground nuclear weapons testing. Concerns about safety or otherwise of nuclear power generation uh, was not the first topic of real kind of public um, consternation or, or debate. It really was about the fallout, coming back to questions that Stephen was asking earlier, what happens when you blow a bunch of these things, of these things up in the atmosphere and stuff comes down? Uh, and so we'll, we will hear a bit about that in Wednesday's class. So, so the first public efforts, uh, first widespread kind of anti-nuclear mobilizations were really also starting by the late 50s. Uh, and they had these kind of fits and starts of, of temporarily successful treaties that would stop but then they, they'd go back. And so, so a lot of the kind of official um, treaty space as well as more informal political organizing against certain aspects of nuclear uh, technologies. That's also growing over the course of 50s into the 1960s. They're kind of growing up together. Yeah. There were efforts, by the way, throughout the early and mid 50s 
to try to mod so-called modernize the weapons side. So to shrink down, so both to make enormously humongous hydrogen weapons that were thousands since many thousands of times more powerful than the fission bombs of the war, of the Second World War, but also to miniaturize them so that they would be more likely to be useful tactically, not strategically. Strategically was the, was the lingo, Luke, as you might know from talking with the folks in security studies, strategic is the idea that is it based, roughly speaking, kind of symbolic? Would, would it be impossible for any enemy to attack you because they, could they be assured of immediate annihilation? Because you have city leveling megaton bombs. So that was seen as strategic to have a kind of unsteady balance of power because no one would be dumb enough to trigger those enormous things for use. Then there's tactical weapons that people might actually plausibly use on a battlefield without the kind of you know, high level uh, of uh, hand wringing about, oh my goodness, it's megatonnage. So people were making so-called Davy Crockett, basically like shoulder fired bazooka sized nuclear weapons, which were actually developed and deployed in the field, thankfully never used, uh, but, but certainly tested. So there was both a miniaturization to make these things more ubiquitous in certain kinds of, of uh, tactical US uh, military planning, not only US, but including US. And then the kind of enormity, the kind of monsters that we'll, that, that, that we'll talk a bit about uh, uh, in next class that were really, um, you know, just made the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki weapons look, look small. It was both these kind of fronts of development on the, on the more uh, weapons technology sides. Those were actively under, under development throughout the 50s. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And, and again, we think back to that, and yet that was not a, a sufficient to end the program, much as the, the fact that poison gas first deployed in the, in the First World War, also, you know, the winds would change and you would not infrequently wind up gassing your own troops inadvertently. So the, 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 the competing calculations about what's gonna be a worthwhile device to, to pursue, uh, unfortunately, that was not unique either, yeah. Yes, it, it's an idea that, that sort of comes and goes. Uh, as, as, as many of you may know, where the US for the time being uh, is still subject to a, um, uh, a limited test ban treaty, which suggests that there can be no, um, well, I'm getting the wrong treaty, actually a more recent treaty. There was a, a, a more complete test ban treaty the US signed starting in 1992. It was one of the last things that President George H.W. Bush signed uh, before, uh, the, before the Clinton administration. So the U.S. presently, by our by treaty statute, is not allowed to test new nuclear weapon designs, and that led to an enormous multi-billion-dollar project called stockpile stewardship. To so there was testing allowed, non-nuclear tests allowed to be performed to to maintain the aging stock stockpiles of existing weapons, epoxies dry out and change, you know, all the kind of convention materials. Um, don't have a shelf life of 10,000 years. So stockpile stewardship is meant to enable laboratory style testing for materials to maintain the existing arsenal, not to develop and perfect new weapons. And so some of these areas get a little, some critics at least say there's a little gray area. Some things that some people will say are being used for stockpile stewardship might actually have implications to help with new designs. It's again, it, it's an area where there's ongoing um, debate and pushback uh, largely uh, you know, away from full public view because so much, much of it still remains classified. Yeah, Amanda, I agree. That is a chilling part. And that, that as I said, those lists were made. In fact, they were made, I think, by the so-called interim committee, which included Oppenheimer and a couple other uh, physicists, as well as the Secretary of War and other uh, military leaders. It was a group of maybe a dozen people. Um, and so, for example, there was a decision made early on, I think, by that group, or at least the recommendation from that group, uh, not to bomb the city of Kyoto, either by conventional means, let alone by um, with the newer weapons, because that was seen as, as um, too kind of culturally significant. Um, it was, you know, a kind of millennium old city of, 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 uh, of art culture and, and, um, and kind of heritage. And so, and that, and that wasn't a kind of nukes versus incendiaries. It was like, don't, please don't bomb that city. The, the uh, US uh, uh, committee advising the US military on that. With the, with the uh, and I think it was part of that same exercise, say what cities would be so-called legitimate targets for use with the nuclear weapons versus other kinds of attack. And I don't know that that means that they thought the bomb was special. I think they thought it was new. And was, I, I think that was the idea of like, what for any new element of the, in the collection, so to speak, 
you want to you know understand its its parameters, its characteristics. So I don't know that, that they that they thought it was somehow in a category unto itself. I think it, my sense of that is that it's it's a new thing. We want to learn about it because we intend to use it a lot more. At least we have we have the option open that this will become a more a more common element of the of the arsenal. We'll talk a bit about that actually again on Wednesday as well. Um, that there were even amidst the debates over whether or not the United States should pursue a hydrogen weapon so much more powerful. The debate was rarely, as we now know, um, nukes or no nukes. It was fission versus fusion. And one leading reason not that was put forward not to pursue fusion weapons because it, it, would, it would slow down the production of lots more fission weapons because the idea, at least among certain influential people, including Oppenheimer, was that the US should have hundreds and not thousands of these things at the ready because at the time they were like very, very few in a stockpile. So, so the, the concern wasn't, these things are so terrible, we should never use anything in this whole category again. People had that concern, but not, not these groups behind the, behind the fence advising, we now know. Their concern was making these things, which might not even work anyway, will interrupt too much making the things that we now know more about because of these things like, you know, um, the usage in, uh, against actual cities and the fact that they were um, not previously destroyed targets, you know, environments. So you could learn a lot from these post-bombing uh, surveys. I mean, it's, you know, <clears throat> yeah, anyway, so that's a bit of a preview. We, we will talk a bit about that on, in Wednesday's class. Yep, yep, yep. No, that's, uh, that's an excellent point. Good, I think we'll, we'll pause there. It was a really interesting discussion. Thank you all for, for uh, taking the time. It was an option during a busy part of the term. So I hope it was uh, you know, uh, interesting and worthwhile discussion. If you, have, if you have other questions, of course, please don't hesitate. I'll have my regular office hours on Wednesday morning. Uh, feel free to email me to make a separate appointment, of course, at any time. And otherwise we'll, um, we'll meet at our regular class time on Wednesday. So stay well, everyone. See you soon.